recording to the cloud. So it's recording now. All right, well, welcome everyone. We are here to talk today about budget. It's our first uh, budget work session of what is three or four work sessions um, prior to this coming to the full council for a council meeting. Um, so as uh, it's been custom, at least since I've been here in the last, last year, we did these uh, budget work sessions to go item by item in the, in the various budgets uh, to talk about what operations are happening there, what capital projects are being planned in the individual budgets. And it's also an, oppor an opportunity for council to um, weigh in on those activities and, and uh, ask questions or um, ask for any particular changes or request in operations or initiatives in the project. So uh, I think we have some citizens and I oh, welcome citizen participation. Um, oh, last year, I think I, I made a joke about um, when we uh, cut, cut our branches, the little branches at Ellis Pond, we had like 150 people get uh, engaged and then soon after we had our budget session, I think we had one person show up. So I hope uh, we um, get more participant engagement as this budget comes before council. All right, so what's the agenda for tonight? Um, we wanted to do things a little different this time around because there were some assumptions, there are assumptions that go into the budget that we really don't talk about. Uh, we don't talk about specifically about how staff allocations happen and some of the expenses that are related to the staff allocations, such as OPERS, Medicare, and all those other things. And I think it's important to talk about um, the personnel and the personnel all allocation because for many of our budgets, particularly general fund, it is over 70% of the budget. So um, it's important to talk about because it has implications throughout the general fund and in the municipal enterprises. So what I want to start off with is the organizational budget. So you have a concept or an idea of where folks are and then go into the salary, salary uh, table and the allocation of personnel. Uh, this will cover a lot of the expenses in the general fund. And it's also an opportunity to, with council to have a conversation about operations and the sizes of any particular departments. And then we'll go into what is the traditional going um, budget line item by budget line item to talk about those expenses. Uh, does that sound good? All right, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm gonna share screen one. All right, so we've got all of this in SharePoint. So we'll start off with our org chart. I've got Brienne Parcels just joined here. Let me minimize this screen here. Okay, this is what our org chart are. Citizens are above everything in the organizations. They are the, the, or the ones with the ultimate power. Uh, they elect council. All the council um, individuals have been updated. I kept the boards and commission schedule as it is. I know that there are some challenges under COVID, um, but these things uh, may change in the coming year. And then there is the village manager, uh, Judy Kittner, as the clerk of council, the village solicitor, Brian Parcels, and the treasurer. You see this dual role, and because there's this dual role, in the org chart, we've uh, uh, created a dual role in the salary allocation sheet. All right, and within the village manager, we have the police department led by Brian Carlson, uh, Denise Swinger, our zoning and economic development, Johnny Burns and public works. Finance director, we have Matt, Matt Dillon, who's the new addition to the team. Uh, HR services, currently it's an outsourced service with Tina uh, Lestowski from uh, HR Elements. And we've got this uh, uh, admin assistant who's also a project coordinator slash office manager, Raven. I think you all know Raven. And uh, earlier in the year, we talked about an adjustment to the position. And that adjustment being that we were looking uh, for a role that's separate from a secretarial role. We wanted somebody that played more of a coordinator role and office manager role. And Raven has really stepped up to that, um, to that role. And she's really... Uh, shaping it and has done uh, a lot of uh, great things for us to improve the efficiency and the productivity of the organization. 
All right, further down the, down the organizational chart, we have public asset access station director, Sean Devine. Um, and then we've got the different department and municipal enterprises down below. Um, the Bryan Center led by Samantha Stewart. The street sewer parks and recreation led by Tanner Busey. Electric and water distribution by Ben Sparks and water plant operations, uh, Superintendent Brad Holt. All right, so then we're gonna look at what does this mean in terms of a cost perspective? What does this all cost us? Um, we've done some we've done some changes into the salary allocation, and this year I'm going to make this small. And if you struggle to see anything, uh, Papa, please let me know so I can uh, make it the right size. We are in a big screen here, so for us we can see a, a big sheet. All right, so this is what we did this year that's separate, different from last year. We were looking at where we allocated uh, staff and we adjusted the allocations to reflect where those staff members actually do the work um, or as close to as an allocation of where they do the work as we could. So an example of that would be uh, Raven. Raven in her, in her role, she was split 50% in council and 50% in planning and zoning. What we've done uh, this year is that Raven really supports uh, the organization across the board. So we, we did a 20% allocation in council, 10% in administration, 35% in planning and zoning. And then we split her out through the uh, municipal enterprises because she provides support in their area, whether it's coordinating a project related to sewer relining or scheduling meeting for those projects, well, the various administrative and project management things that she does, she's contributing to those municipal enterprises. So we've, we've uh, done some adjustment to the allocation based on where those individuals actually do work. Uh, another change, and you're gonna see this reflected in the general fund administration budget is, where do I, as a salary allocation, get allocated? So I'm gonna jump further down to my allocation and you're gonna see the breakout. I was primarily under the administration budget, but my job is to support the entire organization. And there, there, um, some of my time is not uh, necessarily alloc wasn't necessarily allocated in the right way. So we've done an adjustment to the uh, at, to the allocation. So I'm fifty percent admin, and then I'm split across electric at twenty percent, fifteen percent at water distribution, and. 15% in sewer collection. So we've done some changes to how um, the staff allocation are made. And this is to better reflect where folks actually contribute to the organization and how the expenses should roll up to cover all those uh, personnel expenses. So I'm gonna go back to the salaries table here for a second, because it's important to know what's factoring into the salary. How we've come up with a salary allocation for 2021, and you see this reflected throughout the organization, is, is that we look at the 2020 salary and we estimate what potential increases we will see for the next year. So in last year, we've got a council had approved an increase of three, a little over 3% for cost of living adjustment and, te and, uh, and step increases. This year, we've, we've included that 3.5% increase sort of to adjust for cost of living adjustment and, and step increases that happen uh, in the organization because we're on a, on a pay grades that as folks complete their anniversary, they, they get a step increase. So for non-exempt personnel, we adjusted this, we included an allocation to allow for up to a three and a half percent increase. And for exempt personnel, which are all the contract employees to allow for up to 5% increase. So this is how we've come up with the 2021 salary projections based on the 2020, 2020 salary allocations. So then that salary allocation gets carried through our estimates, whether that's benefits, we calculated all the benefits based on their salary. And uh, Matt and I started working on a fringe benefit rate. And in this sheet, we did a, a fringe benefit allocation and we've come up that our fringe benefit 
uh, allocations around 43%. So as we looked at how we're gonna allocate that expense across the organizations, well, it's good to have a fringe <clears throat> benefit rate because it makes it easier to estimate that cost uh, to a department or to a fund based on that fringe benefit allocation because we know it stays pretty, uh, pretty, uh, stays, stays pretty consistent. And that goes the same for the OPRS. OPRS is a fixed um, uh, allocation or expense based on wages uh, for employees, whether that's part-time or full-time. We have to pay an OPRS contribution on all those employees. Now you'll see that there's also a 20% allocation for police officers because police officers get a greater contribution to the pension plan. They get about 20%. So we do have one particular line item broken out for the police pension uh, plan, and that's broken out in the police department. So that's the overview. We can, uh, I, I'm interested in knowing if you wanna look at any particular agency, um, any particular department now, say whether it's council, mayor, administration, in any one of these, we can look at them now for the overall costs and I've added all of those costs up for the departments, or we can discuss them as we get into the actual budget itself, and we see the department, the department uh, budgets. Is there a preference? I don't have a preference. Okay. I see, I see a comment pop up, I don't, is that for me? Is that a chat? I can't see the chat. Okay, sorry, that was, that was for me. Uh, Josue? Yes? This is Mary Ann. I, I have uh, two questions. One is about uh, council uh, stipend. I thought it was uh, 7,200 per year and now it's increased. Can you explain about that? That's one question. The other is what happens as it looks like is happening, it looks like we have, we're gonna have a deficit budget. How, how can we, what is the rationale for increasing salaries when we don't have income to pay them? Okay, I will, the first one is relatively easy. The, the first question is what's happening to the council uh, stipends? So all public elected officials, uh, there's a, a rate table which we are required to pay a minimum, a minimum uh, rate uh, to public officials. And this is table is not set by us. This is something that um, we actually learned late last year and we learned that we had miscalculated that stipend payment for public officials over a three year period. So going back to 2017, 2018, 2019, we had made uh, incorrect payments um, to all public officials. We corrected that going into 2020 uh, and we have that corrected moving forward. Um, we have a pay rate for the public officials and that table includes a pay rate or a schedule that goes out as far as 2029. So for the next nine, eight years, um, we know what, what we have to pay. What's that minimum um, payment that we have to make you so that make to public officials so that you get proper OPRS credit um, in your account. So, so Josue, can I just tag on? Um, so it was Laura Curlis that recognized this. And um, for those of you that don't have the context, Marianne may remember it was prior to us being on council, Judith Hempfling brought this forward because that minimum is how you qualify for OPRS retirement. And her argument was that, you know, people that contribute service to the village should qualify at that minimum. What was not recognized is that that changes year on year. So that's what these updates are reflecting is kind of like a you know, a cost of living adjustment sort of thing. Yeah, so, so that's on the, on the OPRS. On the, on the budget, back in, in June of last year, when I came on board, we started looking at the budget. And to my surprise, we actually were 
where it looked like we would have two, no more than three years left on the reserves. So part of the conversation um, with council members then were, well, what was going on? And it was clear to me that the organization had been uh, saving reserves or underspending reserves and it needed to spend some of those, some of those down. Now, why the organization was underspending funds? Well, there are some, some administrations just weren't doing anything or at least not doing the things that they should have been done with some of those funds, like making critical infrastructure expenses. In 2016, Johnny and I learned that there were things like uh, maintenance lids and uh, traps uh, for storm sewers that needed to be done and none of it got done. This is going back to uh, several, several administrations. So that's where some of those uh, reserves got built up because some work just didn't get done. To add insult to injury, we had employees that say they were doing work and they were in fact not doing the work. So that's how, how some of the reserves got built up. And over the last uh, two, three years, there's been a concerted effort about making the investment, the infrastructure investments that we need to make uh, to our infrastructure system. And so we're spending down a lot of the reserves. And la last year, we ended the year thinking that 2021 was the last day that we, the last year that we were gonna have all these reserves, that we were gonna burn down through the reserves and we will only be left with what our internal um, control uh, amount is, which is over 900,000. We set 900,000 as the reserve minimum for, for the organization. I've got good news to you on, on that end, uh, Marianne, because it looks like we actually did better last year than we expected. So I'm pulling up the, the audit from uh, 2019 that, that ended December 31, 2019, and it shows the um, water ending balance work. So here it is, let me make this bigger. That make, why is that not making it bigger? I want this to be 125, no, 100% maybe, okay. Here's the general fund, um, this is for, they're at the end of the year financials. And as I scroll down, this is the general fund column. We ended the year with $2.9 million. This was the, the fund cash balance for the general fund. So this was better than what we anticipated um, last year ending the year. So this changes the picture a lot for us when we look at our general fund balance. All right, so that changes the picture a lot for us um, and our budget. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you where that general fund balance uh, levels are. And then that gets, then I'll get to your question, Marianne, why are we paying people when we are um, losing money, if you will? <clears throat> All right, so if you recall, we had estimated that in 2021, which this is the year ending for 2021. This three blue columns you're looking at are three different versions of a budget for 2021. For 2021, prior to us updating the ending balance here uh, to 2944, um, we were expecting to dip below a reserve threshold of 900,000. Now that we've updated the actual ending balance uh, for 2019 and the beginning balance for 2020, we are actually performing better than we expected last year. So we're not, we're not anticipating burning through all of our cash reserves in 2021, but we're not gaining a significant amount of time over that. We've got, you know, we've been from uh, 900 or eight something thousand dollars to 1.3 million. So that was, should buy us about a half more year of operations as they are. Um, but I think this is something that we're going to need to address in the next next uh, next year to plan for 2022. So then that gets me to the question to Marianne: Why are we contemplating paying folks more money if we're losing money? When you look at our operations, this is our total expense. 
we'll go up to the top here. This is total expenditures for all of the general fund right here. Our total expenditure for the for the general fund is two two million eight hundred and fifty six dollars and thirty. Sorry, two hundred two million eight hundred and fifty six thousand and thirty nine dollars. That's all of our general fund expenditures before transfers. What is our total revenue projected? Mm -hmm. Our total revenue projection is, I need to go all the way up to the top for our revenue. <clears throat> our total revenue is 3.2 million. And this, this is a revenue adjusted to 2021 year with a significant impact still under COVID. We expect to have reduced uh, income to the tune of almost $300,000 $300, less because of COVID. So we're still, we're, we're, we're open to the reality of what 2021 is gonna look like. We're expecting almost $300,000 less in revenue um, because of the COVID impact. So that amount is actually above our general fund expenditures minus the the, uh, the, uh, the transfers out to the two other, the primarily two other uh, funds that are supported by the general fund. So from our operations, our operations are not, are not all contributing to say a deficit in our budget. We knew that we had these extra reserves and we wanted to spin down from them. So from a budget perspective, we do have funds still available to, uh, to make salary adjustments as as needed the cost now that gets us to the to the actual other question is um, why make uh, salary increases or why allow for increases well there there's an ordinance in the ordinance of the village ordinance for cost of living adjustments it requires uh, three things one is what does the consumer price index say about cost of living adjustments in the area so we look at what's happening in the market and how does inflation affects cost of living in the area. And we try to keep up with that cost of living increase because you know, all of us here, we've got, we've got bills, we've got mortgages and we've got transportation costs and all those things that are just part of life. And as those costs go up, employers typically try to stay in line with those increasing costs because if you don't, people go elsewhere, staff just leave. They got, they got their own expenses. So, so we look at the CPI, we look at what are the surrounding jurisdictions are doing. So we, we call up on municipalities and do a salary survey and see what, what everyone else is doing uh, because that's our, it's part of our competitive environment. Um, and three, do we have the money for it? So for 2021, we've seen the, the CPI go up and down, but overall the CPI is actually going to be closer to 2% of it. COVID isn't stopping inflation and isn't stopping the cost of the cost of living. That cost of living is going to go up. We've already seen it go up in healthcare. We reached out to our um, our um, partners in healthcare, and they anticipate something as high as a single digit cost of increase in healthcare. Uh, so we 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 see that happening. We see it. Inflation is still holding despite despite having been in a in a recession. The the second piece, what's happening in the in the area, we expect the surrounding jurisdictions are going to make uh, cost of living adjustments to their employees. Um, Green County overall, I think they are they are as financially they are weathering the storm. Part of that is that Brandon, the county administrator, has been really good at cutting budgets and reserve, reserving for rainy day fund, and they have more money than they need to spend, so they're doing well, and that's. One of the one of the jurisdictions in the area that we look at, Fairborn took a big hit in income tax, but they also did um, major layoffs to stay within their spending limits. And indications to me, it seems that they're going to make increases as well. Beaver Creek has done well, and and Pete, I had a lunch with the managers two weeks ago. Their their income income tax didn't take major hits that they're expecting. Pete from uh, Pete Vander from Beaver Creek, he actually expects. The income tax to be uh, voted and approved by their their citizens. So, I have reason to believe that our municipal partners are going to make increase. 
And then finally, from the budget, we, we do have expenses in our budget, uh, sorry, funding in our budget to be able to absorb some kind of a cost of living adjustment. Um, so I think you know, I've checked off all three, three items. I think what we, next year, we need to have a serious conversation about uh, some of these transfers out. How are we gonna support operate uh, capital improvement projects and other things that we've been doing in terms of these transfers. This is the table of transfers that, um, that we've incurred over the year. This is the 2019 year, this is 2020, this is our modified 2020, and these are 2021. So if you look at 2018, our total uh, transfers um, were 940,000, and those have steadily increased from 2018 to 2020. We're, we're, we're projecting to be a little lower than we were last year with general funds, um, but it's still to 1.4 million. And a lot of it is, is uh, capital projects that we're looking to fund. Uh, in this project, in this budget, we have included almost $300,000 in capital expenses for the Safe Routes to School uh, project. You know, that's a commitment that council made and the administration made for safe routes to school. So that's 300,000 out of this uh, transfer budget. That's a capital improvement project, one time expense. Um, so I think from an operations perspective, we can absorb a salary adjustment increase. I think it's important that we look to make salary adjustment increase because we've got good talent. We want to retain talent and we want to be competitive with other, other uh, municipalities. And it's, it's also the right thing to do. Yellow Springs is not cheap and, and other communities are also getting expensive to live in, so. Josue, uh, the reason why I asked that question, because I was looking at the information we got and what I am seeing, at least if I'm reading it correctly on the information we got, that our ending balance the general fund balance was going to be just a bit over 700,000, which is very different than the, what you're showing. Yes. So I, I don't understand what, what's the difference there. Okay. And I'm sorry, we, we, um, Matt and I, and, and Johnny, we've, we've been locked up in, in, uh, in the conference room here, uh, making, making adjustments. And we noticed that the tax budget that Colleen prepared back in June, July to submit to the county auditor did not have the updated actuals. And I don't know how Colleen missed it. We've caught it now and we've updated that sheet. And so that's why it looks more promising. So- Okay, but just just that that was what I was going off of because okay. 700,000 didn't seem great. <laughs> right, okay, and thank knew, you. And we knew that last year, right? When we finished the, the budget for 2020, we knew that we were dipping below below the level that we were comfortable with. And so I'm happy to see this $1.3 million as an ending reserves for 2021. Okay. All right, you ready to get into the into the budgets? Uh, Josue, I have a question. I, I do notice, you know, as you've said, you're a lot more comfortable with a significantly lower reserve than past village managers. No, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm just, I wouldn't so, be comfortable with uh, the less than the nine hundred thousand that we've set. I know, but it's been higher in the past, right? Like more hovering in the one point seven to two point three million range. As the minimum reserve. I, I, well, just the end of the year reserves that we've had. Well, the, the, I know that the minimum reserves that we've had over the last three years have been significantly higher because we built up those reserves by not spending and now we're spending them down. Uh, in terms of what I will feel comfortable with, if, if your question is getting to that, I think a $900,000 uh, minimum reserve is what we will wanna, what we will wanna um, target for to not be below that amount. I've had this conversation with Matt earlier as we were talking about um, what would the county auditor or some of the state auditors have to say about if we did below a 900,000? And I think, you know, what, what our position is, is that 
we know we're heading in that direction, we wouldn't need the county auditor to you know, raise any flag for us. We're fully aware of it. What we would need to do is adjust operations when we got closer to that amount. And by based on what we're looking at now, we've got about a year and a half before we reach that point. And we think that within the next 12 months, we would figure out what operations look like moving forward. Johnny and I had this conversation. What does uh, right sizing uh, departments in the, in the general, that are funded by the general fund will look like? Um, so we, we're having that conversation internally. So we know that we want to be at 900,000. We would take some sort of action once we, before we got to that amount so that we can stay, uh, we can maintain that minimum reserve balance. And I just want to jump in and say that, you know, this discussion, discussion around right sizing our budgets started three years ago. Um, and a lot of that was tied to making sure we're investing current taxpayer dollars in, you know, things that are happening that affect them, you know, in real time. Um, so, you know, this started with Patty, Josue came in, understanding that that is, is something that we're trying to get down. And so, but I think it is important that we, you know, do figure out what that right balance is. And I know we've generally been real, con really conservative about our reserves. And, and this is just general fund reserves. It's not electric fund or water fund. Correct. That's just, okay. that's just uh, uh, general fund. I have, I have a, a, sta a uh, statement of cash position as of today. So you can see as of today where we are with all of our assets. So um, as of today, we're still, we're sitting on, um, we're holding, where's that total sheet? There it is. Uh, 8.2 million is the ending balances. And this factors in all the revenue that we've had for the year and the expenses. So that's net revenue for the year expenses to date and here are ending balances. So well, this, is, this is the statement of cash position for all of our funds, including municipal enterprises. So there's still significant uh, reserves in the other um, enterprises. Thank you. So the the what what uh, Brian Howard said is key. We are we are looking at right sizing these funds, um, and we that right sizing is transferring also to some adjustments in how we're allocating certain expenses in the uh, across to the general fund budgets. So I highlight I highlight the administration and my expense because you're gonna see that um, clear in the wages for the administration. So we went from, in 2020, we were looking at $200,000 coming out of the administration, which are funded by the general fund um, activities. My, my, allocate, my um, budget has been shifted across the enterprises because I work for those enterprises as well. And, and they also need to pitch in for that. So you'll see a big drop in wages in administration um, as a result of right sizing the expenses and the, the, the departments. Okay, starting from the top, the first one up, I think it's uh, it's council, yep, a council. So this is what factors into the council. You got wages. So just to give you some context on the columns, I'm gonna go up to the columns. The column T is the tax budget. This is what, but the budget that council approved in order for us to submit as required to submit to the budget commission that is within the county auditor's uh, office. So this is the tax budget that was approved back in June for submission of July. This right here is your October 1 budget version. This is what we've sent to you as, uh, as the initial draft, as the initial recommended budget. And I've set up this column, which is council's uh, 2021 recommended budget. This is where we will track changes that you wanna make. We will track them in this sheet. Um, and obviously we got a column next to it so we can make any notes as necessary. So if you see me, if you make any comment and you see me updating a field from this uh, conversation, I will be making those changes on column B. And uh, I've got 2018, 2019 <coughs> actuals 2020 actuals are not in here, but we have printed out the actual. So if you have a question on how much we spent to date, we can uh, 
we can easily pull that information. But I do want to keep in context that a lot of the CARES Act expenditures happened within the 2020 budget because uh, when we started spending this money, we didn't even know we were going to get CARES Act money because at the time there was no CARES Act. So we allocated a lot of our, our funds to the COVID, uh, COVID uh, response initiative and we incurred a lot of expenses. And over the next, in the month of November, we're going to do a lot of uh, re rebooking transactions to be able to reflect all the expenses in the proper accounts. So if you ask, say, for professional services under the administration, you're going to see a lot of COVID expenses in that line item, which are which would show that we had a lot of expenses, but a lot of them are all related to uh, CARES uh, COVID response. Okay, so council. Here's the wages for council. This includes all the stipends paid to public uh, public officials or council members, and it includes wages for uh, Judy Kittner, the council, the clerk council, and the treasurer. Part-time wages or oh, included there. We included an allocation for that in case additional services um, comes up. But uh, all the council wages also includes the allocation for Raven. The other, other expenses like pension, health insurance, life insurance, workers' compensation, and insurance and Medicare, these, all these allocations, we've done it based on that fringe benefit rate that I made, made reference to earlier. So this is, a lot of this is determined based on the wages and what we expect the life insurance, the, sorry, the health insurance expenditure for those employees are. Any question on personnel? Well, I'm just going to make a comment. I used to have an assistant and now I don't. And well, so I'm paying for an ad and I didn't used to pay for Ruthann. So we have to figure out whether uh, at some point I'm going to get an, a, an assistant or if that's just going to go away because that's, that's how that worked. Okay, well, Raven is still here to assist you in, any, in, uh, in, in delivering of your services, Judy. Um, and we've contemplated her in this budget uh, she may not physically sit over there with you, but um, she's here to help, and she's a tremendous resource all around. So if you wanna, if you wanna, okay. Well, then there may be. Okay, then I will say at various times I've got a four-hour project I need to pull your pull Raven because I'm I'm paying for those services because I'm there are things I'm not doing because I don't have an assistant. But that's all. I'm just I'm just saying that's not normally the way that's allocated. The admin assistant was not coming out of council at all in the past, and that six thousand dollars was for a council clerk assistant. Period. So we'll have to have that conversation. And and if you want to explore a different setup than we have, we can certainly pull Raven back and hire someone specifically dedicated for you. I think that there would be a missed opportunity there because Raven has such uh, roots or connection to everything else going on in the organization that she has the contacts and that's an added value for council. Is she already full time? She is full time, yes. Well, Judy definitely needs assistance. There's no doubt about that. So what, what would that look like? Because we allocate a time of Raven's uh, time to assist council. I think there's some project management and project scheduling that we need to work with. And I think that's the, that's the pain, for, pain point because you're used to having her physically dedicated in your space working for you. I think that she can still accomplish your task while being here in the in the main in the main office with us. Well, not not filing, not they're not not everything. No, some things yes, but uh, I guess it's a conversation because I just gave it up. I mean, I just gave it up. I was used to having eight hours a week of a person, and I assumed I just don't have that person for. You know, I might get maybe thirty minutes a week. So to me, it's just like, well, I'm, uh, you know, basically paying for something that, uh, that isn't doing what it used to do. I was, before we were paying 6,000 bucks a year, uh, eight hours a week from a person, and that's the expectation. So that expectation shifted, and I think that's fine, but uh, then I'm going to want a dedicated number of hours per week. 
physically. I know what I can do. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll have that conversation. There's I don't that, care where uh, she is yeah. physically. <laughs> I don't care where she is physically, but if I know that I've got X number of hours a week, then I'll give her projects and things. My assumption now was I don't have her. She's gone. And then I found out I was paying. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, then that's a conversation we need to have. Okay. All right. Well, well let's, uh, let's talk through it and let's uh, see if we can find a solution that works for all of us. So just a general comment, Josue, and this is my experience. <clears throat> you know, 5% is kind of on the high side of an annual raise. And the reason for that is when you run the numbers out, even five years from now, it, it has a compounding effect, right? If you keep that up. And it's not only just 5% on the salary, you also have to pay more for the employer's share of OPERS and other payroll taxes um, on those higher salaries. Um, I'm not saying people don't deserve it. I'm just saying, are we doing something that's untenable in the long run? And this is for the exempt employees, contract employees. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, especially in a bad year, I'm more, kind of used to the one to two percent range well I, well the one the one percent will be low based on what the cpi alone is yeah so so what uh marianne maybe you know so the social security cpi they just increased was what 1.5 percent marianne do you know no I, I i don't know but i um I guess share the concern that you have raised. So just just a thought about, and then I suppose we get to revisit this all again after November third if the levy doesn't pass. Right. Um, I think I think for for wages for non-exempt employees, it's important to stay as close to the CPI as we can. I think for non-exempt employees, uh, these are your contract employees and these are your performance-based employees. Unlike the, the non-exempt, which routinely get the COLA, they routinely get the step increase, the exempt employees are under a different pay recognition, recognition structure. I think that the increase should be closely aligned as much as possible to the performance of those individuals. Um, I, you know, I, I work hard and I try to deliver and create as much value as I can. Certainly everyone in the management team uh, is pushing in that direction. And I would hope that council would make an allocation to reward performance. I certainly don't wanna, one of the things I've tried breaking away in the government is following the traditional status quo is that people just expect expects uh, standard increases. I don't think anyone here expects a standard increase. We're gonna work for, we're gonna work and we're gonna perform to earn any increases that, that, we, uh, that we can get. And I think a 5% will be, will be a, a healthy allocation to make. I think just this year, I think the team has shown its value on how good it creates, uh, how good it creates value for the organization. We've secured a $1.7 million grant that's gonna that's money to the village. So when you look at the contributions that the management team is making, we're multiplying our salaries by multiples and the additional revenue that we are bringing in to the village, something that previous administrations haven't done. I know my predecessor was making significantly more money that I'm making and you know, they weren't held to the same performance standard. I'm holding everyone in my team accountable to the highest performance that we can deliver. And I need to be able to reward that performance. Josue, this is Mary Ann. Uh, first of all, <laughs> I, I don't think any of us, I, or I should put it positively, I think we all appreciate the work that all the staff does and it's uh, tremendous. So any of my concerns are not about the work the staff does. I'm wondering if, uh, to Laura's point, uh, Matt could do a, say, a 10-year projection. What, what's it going to mean if 
if we do 3.5 for uh, non-salary and 5% for salary, you know, over 10 years, and then does it, does it look like our income is going to be matching? Of course, it's not just salaries, I know, but I don't know how far we, how far do we project out? Or do we? The, well, for the, um, for the general fund, we, we're, not, uh, we're not projecting beyond two years. For the capital, we're projecting out to five years. Uh -huh. So that's something, Matt, is that something that you can take on, project uh, yeah. salaries? And we could do it. We've got the table already set up, so we could project out <laughs> as many years into the future as, as, as we want. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the concern. I, I share the concern at some point, these incremental annual uh, increases are not sustainable, but the, the attrition rate helps, helps resolve some of that. You know, when you, when you've got people that retired or move on to a different, to a different role and move on outside the organization, you get an opportunity to sort of reset, reset some of that expense. One of the things you're going to see it reflect here is we no longer are carrying a $75,000 HR expense and all the sa and all the fringe benefits associated with it. And I'm being, I'm being intentional about vacancy management of that role so that we can create some additional savings now that we have the opportunity to create some savings in there. So that's part of, part of my performance management and, and, and managing the organization is how do, we, how do we hold off on doing any hires in that role, save some money, and still deliver the same result, if not better. And I would say that we're delivering a better result now with the HR setup that we have. So, Matt, is that? And it's a, sorry. sorry no, the, I mean, it's a, play, it's a placeholder, right? The 5% uh, sort of sets that aside, but if, if council decides, well, we can't do it this year and it's 3%, it's okay. You end up with a little extra in the, in the general fund that doesn't commit you to the five percent correct that's true judy and that's how we did it last year right we we put in that uh three and a half percent for for staff and we ended up doing two and a two and a quarter, quarter. so we, we we didn't expend all of it all right let's see uh lisa has her hand up yeah thanks i i just want to say that um you know, we're not alone as an entity uh, in struggling with forecasting during these times. And although we're a municipality and not a, not a business, there, there still is this need to forecast. And the period of time for which entities are able to forecast is, is shrinking and shrinking. I mean, it used to be that entities would do like a 20-year strategic plan or a 10-year strategic plan. And those days are gone. Those days are gone. So while I think that this ex we need to have extreme um, focus and be fiscally conservative, we need to understand that even a five-year forecast, it has, in my way of thinking, perhaps limited value just because of so much uncertainty. And so I appreciate that there's a lot of other things to do um, I just would question um, the the value of too much long term um, forecasting, given that we have at, at at best imperfect information. So, just a comment about forecasting. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Kevin Stokes, see your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. Way. Um, yeah, you just mentioned the savings that we, uh, the, the gross savings uh, we're getting by not having that $75,000 in the HR position. Can you remind us what the uh, typical annual expenditures will be for the HR contractor so we can see what the real savings is, is closer to? Sure, sure. We're staying under $30,000 on, on HR services through uh, HR elements. So we know that that's going to be a relatively fixed cost. For what we were spending, or, or what our, our salary expense for the previous HR administrator was a little over seventy-five thousand, and when you add the forty-three percent fringe benefit rate to that, uh, you exceed a hundred thousand dollars. So we're looking at around seventy thousand dollars savings. Okay. 
Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Moving on to train, travel, and training. In, 20, in the initial 2020 uh, uh, budget, the council had an $8,000 uh, travel and training uh, expense. This was for all the council members and the staff. Uh, as a result of the COVID cutbacks, we cut that back to 4,000. And for the 2021, we think we can push that up uh, to 6,000. But obviously this is uh, what uh, the council's discretion if you wanna see more in travel and training for council. Keep in mind that currently as the as of projections of last week, we anticipate being under limited travel uh, through the first quarter of 2021. Uh, Trump himself said that that November one uh, vaccine is not gonna be delivered until later in the later in the year if if uh, if possible so we're probably looking at a vaccine being available may possibly in the year but no mass um, adoption until at least that end of the first quarter so with that in mind i think we were limited to any large gatherings and large travel uh, and training activities so any travel and training may may still be online or virtual uh, at least through the first quarter of the year. So if you had allocated, we thought 8,000 for four quarters, 6,000 is aligned with being able to do activities in three quarters. Any, 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 um, any changes that council would like to see there? You know, Josue, the only thing I'll say is, uh, and I say it every year, my predecessor said it before me, I always encourage all council members to use the training budget because there are a lot of areas that we can gain more expertise in. Uh, I think a lot of times we don't think about it or we're reluctant to um, you know, spend that uh, budget item, but uh, it's an important investment that makes a big difference for the village. And I guess related to that, um, you know, Kevin Stokes is gonna be stepping up the implicit bias. So, um, Maybe that's, you know, maybe we're more intentional about using that budget in the moment. Um, so Kevin, keep that in mind. But I think that number is fine. Okay. Thank you. And year to date, let me see, year to date, you've only spent $314 in that, um, in that budget. So Kevin, if you're thinking of any trainings, there's money in that budget for this year. So, gotcha. All right, moving down to uh, non personnel expenses, contractual services. Um, I, I walked through the list with, uh, with Judy, and um, one of the things that we've got so in all these expenses, I think the one that, the, that was the most concerning for her was the, the $25,000 expense here, and where we properly allocating um, a budget for clerk base. Um, the American legal uh, legal publishing for three types of expenses. One is the codified ordinances and, uh, and some other line items. So I've, uh, I've walked through these numbers with Judy, all of them, um, including the, the advertising, which is all the legal advertising. Uh, and so this is a, that was a pretty good estimate. Uh, it was my understanding, right, Judy? So the other conversation that, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yes, it was accurate. We found some areas where we had to spend more in this year. Um, some of the legal notifications for the charter amendments, those kinds of things that were a little bit pricey, village manager search. So um, those don't need to be repeated. Correct. And so the, what Judy's referencing is you'll see a, a uh, $50,000 allocation in 2019. And those expenses, some of those were related to village manager search and other activities that are not ongoing. So for 2020, we were able to reduce that to half. And, uh, and for 2021, the Judy thought that that 21,000 allocation allows the council to continue its uh, professional service expenses. The other expense that is in council is in the legal services category and this covers a significant portion of our village uh, solicitor. <clears throat> a 
Okay, all right, on office supplies and operating uh, supplies, all of these expenses here are in line with what um, council has uh, traditionally spent. Uh, so we kept those, uh, those uh, budgets in line with what uh, historical expenditures are. Uh, but if council wants to make any, any adjustments here, this is, uh, this is your budget. Okay, all right, so that brings us a council budget to 285. Um, it's, what, it's in line with what we had initially projected in, uh, uh, for 2020. So we're trying to get back to, uh, it looks like we're getting back to that number uh, for 2021. Okay, mayor's budget. I've, uh, we met with the mayor. She's not here in this conversation and she's uh, agreed to, to this budget. The wages includes uh, her uh, mayor's uh, clerk, uh, which is Elise Burns, and includes the the stipends for the uh, for for the mayor. We are working on an adjustment here, but I think we've got everything right, which is the the health insurance and the in the life insurance piece, where we um we need to make adjustments here because uh, currently at least. Elise and the mayor are not participating in those programs. So we need to fix this for the next uh, iteration. So uh, all the other expenses, she was in agreement with the travel and training, the contractual fees here, the postage, they do use postage. They do have membership services. Uh, we allocate a small amount of the telephone expense. This is our voice over IP, uh, oh, voice over IP system. Which, uh, with a lot of the expenses, we're trying to put it in the, in the right place. They have a phone expense. In the past, it had not been uh, billed to them, but you know they have phones like uh, every other office here. So we're trying to allocate that expense where it needs to be. Likewise for hardware, um, she's okay with uh, advertisement. This, this uh, advertisement fee, gets, gets, it's part of the legal notices that, that uh, Judy puts out in terms of when meetings are. Their legal advertisement is when mayor's courts takes place. And that covers um, the mayor's budget. What you don't see in this budget that was initially put in 2020 was the $15,000 for a prosecutor. Uh, we didn't carry that over into 2021. I think that's a conversation with council uh, and, the, and the mayor from the administration's perspective, looking at the caseload and what cases can or are her in mayor's court. Uh, there isn't, with the exception, with the OBI cases, which can come to mayor's court, I don't know that we would be making, providing a better service to those residents by hearing those cases uh, here in, in the village because we're not able to do what a court of record can do. Uh, and we're not able to provide victim and advocate services to a mayor's court unless we set aside an expenditure uh, for those services. Yeah, so it's not about doing OBIs, you know, it's about who presents the cases and who has the power to run a diversion program. And, and that's an, a larger conversation for council. But I have a different question, Josue. Um, why is the mayor's court employment line item so much higher than in 2019? The, the, it's highlighted in orange because Matt is working on a number. What we, what we did in the, what happened in the uh, salary allocation. So we, we're still doing some uh, adjustments, tying it up. For at least Burns, at least Burns a part-time employee and when we pulled in the estimate, the system added up her salary for what it would be on 20, 80 hours. Now she doesn't work 20, 80 hours. So we need to adjust the, this number by the proportional number of hours that she works. So that number is gonna be closer to the, um, do you have the number that we came up with? Every? For Elise, for Elise or for that total um, heirs budget. So this number is going to go down, Laura. We, okay. we, we did spot that a calculation error on the math. Um, 
but yeah, so that number will come down, but it's at least Burns and um, and um, and the mayor's uh, stipend out of that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's highlighted there, and I will. Just a historical question. I really don't know the answer to this. And I know it would add to costs, but um, why do council people not participate in health insurance and life insurance on a, like a pro rata basis? I think that's a council question and they are able to vote and, and have that participation. I know the township, the township has a unique arrangement where they get health insurance. I mean, uh, for me personally, if if the Supreme Court gets rid of the ACA, I no longer have health insurance, so I have no access to it. I know. I, I that's. Um, I think, that's how I get it now. Yeah, no, it's in Ohio. I think in Ohio, that's going to have a detrimental effect to the healthcare market, um, not just from and accessibility perspective, but also from an overall healthcare expense, because one of the things that has been able to control healthcare expenses was the individual mandate requiring that everyone participate. And that was a better instrument to controlling costs versus all those that are uninsured just showing up to the emergency room and costing uh, uh, healthcare increase across the board. So uh, it's, I just historically how one elected official has it and the other elected officials don't. Yeah, uh, Brian or Marianne, do you know anything about that? <coughs> no, I didn't know we could have it. Uh, yeah, it's not been discussed much. I mean, I think uh, my understanding is that when it's come up, it's been more ad hoc, but we certainly can discuss it. And some places give you access, but the elected official pays most of the cost because they are part-time or if they're half-time like the mayor probably could be considered more half-time I don't know you know it's it's usually some percentage I, I think township trustees do that in a lot of places so all right thank you welcome all right but I, I would say that would be a, a you could have that we could have that conversation with our provider if that is something that came up how that would work well, I, I don't think that's off the table. Yeah, just access and then versus the cost levels of cost and maybe at least access would might be nice. I think access, let, let's, uh, let, me, um, let me look into that. I know that typically the thinking of part-time employees, part-time employees that are below 30 hours are not um, eligible for benefits. However, if they did want to participate in the group plan, they would be able to, but they would have to, like you said, Laura, they would have yeah. to pay their portion. Um, I think for one of the things, yeah, well, I'll, I have to talk to the provider and uh, I, will, I will engage McGowan in, in, in that conversation. If that's, if that's something- Yeah, that, that would be great. Is that something of interest to council? It is to me. I think it's good to have the information so that uh, we can make informed decisions. And I think it should be consistent. So good point, you know, about it, you know, kind of equal availability to all of elected officials. Okay. okay. All right, got it. All right, now we get into the administration budget. Um, wages, here's gonna, you notice a significant change in the, in the wages and that's driven by, sorry, where am I going? Um, where we allocated a lot of my time and Matt's time. So we'll start off with whoever's on the top of the list in administration. Here's who's allocated to administration. Uh, 
10% for Raven, 25% for, for Matt, 50% for me, and that comes up to just under one FTE. And the total expense for that is, the administration expense is right here. And all of these numbers, healthcare insurance, uh, life insurance, workers comp, dental, and Medicare get transfer over, including the 14% uh, OPRS contribution. So that makes up the total personnel expense. Any questions on personnel for administration? Okay. Um, travel the training is important to uh, to us here. I think it's important that everyone's up to date with skills and building their capacity to uh, increase their productivity and efficiency. So we want to leave that uh, at the same rate as it was scheduled in 2020. We are, however, mindful of, of utilizing it, and so we try to stay within our or travel expenses. So to date, to date, we have spent, we spent, uh, what is the total expense? $441. And three of those hundred was to uh, training on the VIP system. So we're being mindful of how we uh, spend training, training dollars, but we want to have it available there for the services. Okay, moving down, we've got uh, the retainer for Rita is incorporated in there. This is a this is a three percent uh, expenditure on the income tax that they collect. So that's a uh, we've got little control over over that. That's uh, a Rita tax expense. Um, rentals and leases, we've got seven thousand dollar expense in there. If you're wondering what uh, rental leases we have. A lot of our computers are rented from Dale. This was something that was put in place uh, before I came on board. Uh, so we, we have that obligation out uh, on these rentals. So that gets split across the organization and rentals and leases and hardware and software support. The, we have the $90,000 expense here in, in, um, in professional services that what drives that increase is the uh, expense that we have for HR elements. As you know, we have saved, we have saved in, in, in uh, wages and salaries by not having that HR administrator up at there. And, but we've incurred an increase here in professional services for HR services. So that's driving the, the change there. Uh, and most other categories remain the same. We have, um, made little changes for the exception of the hardware and uh, software support. We have a higher demand for software support. COVID has really uh, put pressure on our IT infrastructure. And so we've had to adapt with that. Uh, an example of that is we've got you know, these uh, conference rooms that are wired for uh, teleconferencing. We've also <clears throat> acquired SharePoint, which is what you are what you're seeing the spreadsheets on. So we've added a lot of technology and with that, that comes some support. We've also added, uh, added uh, expenses for legal services. This includes the other portion of expense for the, for the, the uh, village solicitor and other legal expenses that may come up. In total, we have a $90,000 um, uh, legal expense allocation which is well in line what has been previously, previously spent um, on legal services. Overall, our legal services expense uh, from uh, the village solicitor role has gone down. Um, Brianne is on the line, so uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to insult her saying that we're spending less on village solicitor because we're getting a hell of a service from from Brianne. I think she's been a, an, a great addition. Uh, to have her and it's costing us a little less money. Okay, so that gets us down to contractual services. Any questions? Okay, moving on to supplies. We kept the supplies relatively the same. Um, we're at, we are at 15,000 proposed for, for uh, 2021, and we're at $14,200 um, for 2020. I'll pull up my 
my expenses to date here and of the of those expenses it looks like we have spent where are those expenses actually this one includes we actually spend down uh, most of it because this is where we have a lot of the COVID expenses and operating supplies and other things like that. From one of your side. Yeah, so we've spent down that money, most of it. Thank you, Johnny. But when we do all the, when we do the balancing of the, uh, of the CARES Act money that we get and we put, uh, reallocate those expenses, those lines are gonna, those expenses are gonna come down. Okay, moving on auditor expenses. The auditor expenses, uh, there's an overall increase and this is due to moving over to gap accounting. Um, we wanted to move this to gap accounting this year um, and we're certainly preparing that. One of the, the auditors are preparing the sheets uh, for reporting for 2020 under, under gap. Uh, for 2021, I showed you the audit state, the audited financials, and I can send that, send those over to you. Those were still on a cash basis. Uh, we wanted to have those on a gap uh, reporting platform, but there was some uh, miscommunication with the auditors, and we we actually the, we had some miscommunication, but there was a key element of our of our gap conversion that we were missing, and that was that we did not have a valuation of the village assets. So there's no way to do a gap uh, counting and reporting if we didn't know what our assets were. So the, the, um, the CBIS team and the, and the auditors are working on doing the valuation. So what's involved in the valuation, there's two things. One, there's an inventory process, inventorying all of our assets uh, uh, that are worth either individually or collectively above uh, $2,500 and then evaluating the properties that we have and what those values are. And that becomes the basis of our assets, what our assets were. Uh, so we, we should have that done uh, in the next month prior to the closing of the year. And that's a uh, key for the, the gap uh, accounting reporting. So we'll be able to meet that goal. That also has an increase in our overall expense. Okay, rental properties. This is the um, this is our rental properties, which consist of the the train station and what else, Johnny? What else is in our, in our rental property? Uh, the pottery shop is in there as well. The pottery shop. So these are there's two things. Oh, we also have property taxes that get paid out of there. And we've had a major I don't know if it's a blunder we will call it, but um, we've had a significant increase on property tax, and that's because we lost our farm subsidy and we lost it because our farmer did not farm the properties as required. So David Graham, as great as he is, he's also great at spotting these things and sent us a bill um, and said we've lost our farm subsidy. So that's that significant increase down here. Johnny is, uh, is uh, strategizing how to uh, correct that and this is the first time I said it publicly. It may mean doing away with our with our current farmer. So, Josue, did he I just like not make any money? No. So, what happened the, with uh, the farmer? I, I don't know if you guys want me to say his name, but there were weather conditions that made it challenging for him to to farm. So, what he did was he filed an insurance claim and and used the weather conditions as the justification for filing a claim against insurance, he got paid uh, for loss of income, but we lost our farming credit because yeah. we didn't did, farm properties. Did he not plant or did he not harvest? He did not plant two fields. Okay. That, yeah, uh, that, that'll take it out of CAUV <laughs> when they do their, when they do their inventory of CAUV properties, that'll, that'll do it. <laughs> I That's almost too had, bad. I almost had to give uh, Johnny some lithium because we could avoid it by just simply planting some uh, cover some, crops. Yeah. yeah, yeah, some cover crops. So it's it's pretty harsh. A lot of auditors will let a farmer go fallow for a year. You he know, did. 
<laughs> he, he, did. he did. He let him use that excuse that they the last year. Uh, but it, oh, by, by the time he did it this year. Okay. Yeah. So, is there going to be any heartburn uh, from council if we did a cover crop or found another method? Well, um, cover crop, we should we should probably do that. At least, you know, and you don't you have to. November 15th for cereal rye. Yeah. I mean, it'd probably be worse. Well, maybe the contract with the. Maybe the contract with the farmer in, it, it says he's got a plan. He's got to plant something. Or, well, or you can cancel the contract. got a contract through December. Uh, but that's not something that we're interested in. Well, anyway. It's costing us money. It's costing yeah. us money. That's the, the well, I take it away from him. I mean. What about winter wheat? Winter wheat? Yeah, isn't that planted now? Yeah, so the, the, he's, he's got the land under contract through December. Yeah, uh, winter, wheat, winter wheat is usually planted in September, early mm -hmm. October. We're getting mm -hmm. into the last crop of the year, which because it's getting colder, you're looking at something like cereal rye that can overwinter. I mean, in, in the interest of time, I feel like this is maybe a conversation yeah. at a level of detail yeah, for yeah. another time, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Um, operating supplies. We actually made an adjustment here because we've had a lot of cleaning supplies, toilet paper and things like that that were not being properly allocated to the rental prop to the rental property budget. Uh, the John Bryan Center was stuck with all that toilet paper. And you will be amazed how much toilet paper we go through at the uh, at the train station. So uh, we've had to increase that. Um, we've also increased, made an allowance for a capital expense, and this has to do with a roof repair project that we need to do at the train station. This is something that's been on the capital projects chart, and it's just been uh, pushed off. And uh, we hope we can uh, we can uh, get that done this year. Uh, unless we some, found, some way find a way to push that off. But uh, that roof uh, needs repairs. Johnny is shaking his head to push it up. So, all right. So that's the rental, rental property budget expense. You'll see a significant increase and that's due to property tax payment for those fields that we've lost the uh, farm subsidy. Okay, now to the library. Library expenses are pretty consistent. There, you know, it's a total of ten thousand. Um, we did have a lot of repairs in twenty nineteen, more than we expected. We had to repair the the uh, retaining wall and do uh, the handrails and a few other things. Uh, and the condenser, the condenser broke, um, but the library, for the most part, has been low maintenance. Any questions on? Cable TV on the uh, library? Okay. Yeah. Ahead. What's happening with the um, universal bathroom ADA? So we, um, the, con the, uh, the engineer and the architect have, have uh, drafted preliminary design plans. We've had a bit of a tussle or a back and forth because Connie, Connie and other members of the library association wanted us to restore the terrazzo floor and the glaze block tile and it just drove price, uh, the cost uh, too high, much more than what council had uh, authorized. So we said it was gonna be a complete demo and rebuild. So the, uh, the uh, architect is working on that. And we, when do we expect the bid documents? Bid documents should be mid November out for bid and under contract by December. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the timeline. There are some changes happening to the overall library um, design the under COVID. Initially, when we started this project, we were not contemplating touchless uh, devices, touchless sink, touchless toilets, and whatnot. Um, we had to modify that the because we're under COVID. You don't want people touching the same uh, handle on the toilet. So the, that's 
that change took some time to factor in. Um, when did we have the meeting with them? Three weeks ago? Yes. So three weeks ago, we settled on what those changes uh, would be. Uh, so we're back on we're back on schedule, but you know, with that delay, doesn't mean we didn't stop doing work. We we transitioned to working on the HVAC systems, and we have uh, retrofitted the library with an ionizing technology uh, that pure that treats the air, removes viruses, bacteria, and mold spores. So um, while we put put off the the bathroom design, we worked on the HVAC systems and got that work done, and that's being covered uh, with CARES money and not general fund money. We also power washed. Oh, we also power washed the library. Okay. Great, thank you. You're welcome. On cable TV, um, wages, those are the part-time wages. Those are the part-time wages for, for um, uh, Sean. That and then there's a pension plan, a pension expense that's associated. Matt, we need to adjust this number too. Um, this healthcare insurance piece, uh, we need to make that a, 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 an adjustment there because he's currently not participating in the in the program. Worker, workers' comp has to be paid, and so does uh, uh, Medicare. Then professional services and uh, equipment maintenance. These are these are ongoing expenses that we have for the cable TV. That's um, we have a support agreement with the uh, people, the, the the makers of the broadcasting system. So um, part of that expense come out of professional services and maintenance of equipment. Um, so those are standard uh, expenses that we need for the station. And the uh, the overall budget for for the um, station is forty five thousand in this iteration. Um, but the when you look at the revenues that are dedicated for for the cable TV, we typically get more revenues from the franchise fee that we get from our cable subscribers, uh, and that meets all the um, the financial obligations to cable TV. I think you've seen the value of cable TV in, in this COVID uh, pandemic. Um, Sean has really been instrumental in getting the message out and being able to uh, broadcast all of our meetings. Uh, you've also seen a, a lot of improvements in the system. We can simultaneously cast uh, to Facebook and we've incorporated other technologies that allow for the ASL interpreter, um, messaging on the screen, and better, better scheduling. So we've done some uh, upgrades to the system. Josue, where does Philip's salary come in, or wages? Philip's salary, if you recall early on, um, we made a commitment that we wanted to keep as many employees on as possible. The, the Philip O'Rourke was under the Parks and Recs budget and we continue, Philip, under that budget, uh, under the John Bryan Center. Um, Johnny's shaking his head because we've had several conversations on um, where he needs to, to be allocated. So currently, he's still allocated in that in that category because we don't have a another position that's been created by council for us to to put him at. So there isn't a. Um, we have a contracted service that we can do as such as a communications or other things, but I've been sensitive to spending um, more money if we already have a budget. And this is where Johnny's looking at me again, because I think he's still providing a service to Parks and Rec, and we just left Philip in that budget. And we're able to bill Philip's time to the CARES money. So because of the role he's been playing, he's been primarily assigned to a COVID related response. So it is eligible under the salary uh, reimbursement under CARES. And he was factored in in the uh, salary allocation that that uh, the team here worked on and that team included uh, Brian House when we were looking at all the expenses, so. I think that's a good use of uh, COVID funds, by the way. Thank if you. you can, if you can find a place to do it, I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marianne, did that answer your question? Okay. No, right. I'm good. Okay. 
Okay, this is now we are in the council commission's budget. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I would um, I put this uh, or ask Kevin and Lisa to weigh in because this is really, they, they're the ones who, who, uh, who, who manage these funds and significant user of the funds. The only thing that we've carried over the 2020 budget with the exception of the, um, the $15,000 that was initially slated for the senior center, um, we carried everything over except for that. And this is where council um, gets to weigh in on what do you envision for refunds and reimbursements in the council commission's budget. Well, I mean, I, I, all I have to go on would be historical information, histor historical data. Um, and, and there has actually, there's already been a request for HRC funds, um, you know, but that was asking us to retroactively cover something. So um, it's been difficult to get HR, the members of the HRC to get together and say what they want to do. But um, if I were just to, to pick a number um, over the last couple of years, uh, if, if the next year is anything like the past years, not 2020, um, HRC would probably be somewhere in the eight, $8 to $9,000 range. Okay. How about the Arts Commission? So the Art and Culture. Oh, go ahead, Marianne. I, I have a problem of HRC having that much money and not being willing to meet. I understand. Um, um, now, th th this might get into a conversation that's beyond our budget hearing, but I do have that concern. I understood, and I, I will, I, I, I accept and appreciate your concern, but when you consider the fact that we're just talking about budgeting in terms of planning, you know, I think it's uh, appropriate to go ahead and plan, um, and then if the commission never does meet, then, then it's not an issue. Um, so Art and Culture Commission is um, really working hard um, through the pandemic with an understanding that during this time of heightened awareness on social justice, which is right in the heart of our mission, we have to do all we can. And um, so, you know, we have um, three, three major projects in the pipeline. However, the members of the commission understand that we are not the community foundation. We're not a granting entity. So our individual um, contributions to projects tend to range between one and 5,000. And we're really focusing on trying to support um, artists and artist consortiums to um, you know, find additional funding sources. And then we can provide not only that extra lift, but also, you know, the support and amplification of the importance of this work from the village of Yellow Springs. So, I mean, I would like to see um, continued investment in, in public art in Yellow Springs as it supports our village values. So my sense from uh, when we made the decision last year about the uh, support of the senior center was that that was an ongoing uh, uh, allocation. And so I think 30,000 um, makes sense if 15 of that is, is earmarked for the senior center. And then we can think about what that other 15 looks like um, when we get into the nitty gritty next year with commissions. That, that sounds good. Yeah, I agree. All right, I've jotted down that, that uh, the change. All right, um, it is, uh, is 6.30. You wanna roll into the next uh, budget? Yeah, I think Laura said she had to leave. Maybe she already did leave. 
Okay, Judy, Judy, until what time we, we have this? So, seven, okay. All right, well, hopefully we can get a, get through the public safety budget uh, in that time. All right, public safety, police department. A lot of these personnel expenses, everything here, we, this one we did spend significant time uh, making sure that it is right. So we got all the employee, the uh, police allocations in this budget, the total salary expense, and um, what that full, the full-time expense, the part-time, and what it all adds up to, and then the associated fringe benefits. Uh, and that in benefit, including making a distinction between what is a 14% pension contribution for non-commissioned officers, and then a 20% uh, pension contribution for police officers. So you know we're required to make uh, that contribution for police officers that's separate from the um, the police, uh, the regular dispatch and other employees. So what does that translate to? That is the personnel expense. Um, for the police department was not included in that other and that in that uh, salary allocation expense is the $34,000 for uniform and this is 10,000 for ongoing uniform expense in a $24,000 uh, uniform upgrade allocation. I've heard from council and citizens that um, that you would like to see a different type of uniform and we estimated that out that that will cost an additional 24,000 to do a new uniform design and in, in, uh, in change and provide every officer with a new set of uniforms. So we included that expense in the uniforms expense. And then the other expenses that remain uh, steady, the pre-employment physicals, which are, um, they, they're subject to uh, drug testing and other physical exams as the other public works employees are. And then there's an, uh, an expense for recruitment and testing. Uh, we uh, also have psych uh, an allowance for psychological uh, exams. That's uh, should we have incidents we're required to provide some of these uh, services. Did I miss anything, uh, Leonis? Yeah, Paul, we took up polygraphs because we now get those like I don't know if you, yeah, can you hear Naomi? No, I didn't. Um, the polygraph line, we used to, uh, we had that budgeted at look, 1,500, but we now get those free, so we've taken that off. Um, everything else is pretty much the same. I, I have a question. Uh, the Both the pre-employment physicals and or the psychological exams, which one of those or to what degree either of them is tied to planned future hires and does that mean you have hires planned for this year for the upcoming year we anticipate hopefully one peace officer hire and that's a replacement that's a replacement and uh an as needed part-time dispatcher as a replacement and that will fall under the pre-employment physical however for officers and any sworn personnel, um, they must go through a psychological exam. So whether they pass or not, we are obligated obviously to pay it. Okay, good, thank you. So just to clarify that the total head counts unchanged. No changes to the head count, correct. Got it, thank you. Okay, moving on. To now, I, no, I, I do have questions, okay. concern. So I'm just looking at the bottom line of public safety total uh, 2018 to 2021. So that'd be three years, basically a half a million dollars added. Um, yes. That's a lot. I, I mean, is are we seeing a half a million dollars being added in other and, and mostly, it's not only personnel, of course, but large, no, it isn't only personnel, like personnel expenses are going up about, well, that accounts for 300, over 300,000. So a lot of it is personnel. Biggest expenses and in, in personnel. And 
I'm aware of at least one position that's been added that's being like Florence is full time role. That's a new addition from uh, 2018. Tell me to see where it's a half a million dollars. Uh, yeah, go down, go down to the bottom of public safety total and look at 2018 and then go all the way and look at 2021. So what we went from about 13, under 1300 to uh, well over uh, uh, 1700,000. So we have had some changes in staffing since then, not under, not in 2020 to 21. The only, the only change that's happened there is with Florence being full time, but to make up for Florence's job, we transition out a part-time staff to make up that difference. So there's no net change in, um, in the headcount right. department. So that's Matt, Josh Knapp's uh, position. I don't know if you, if you are aware with, with uh, Josh Knapp. So Josh retired uh -huh. and we've uh, reallocated that role and responsibility with, which is heavily reporting and, and database work to other members of the team and, and uh, Florence uh, is now full-time. So no net change in 2021. So the, the salary expense that you're looking at from, from uh, 2019 to 2021, that is that is uh, almost a uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase that you're seeing there. And um, instead of staff positions, I I don't think there's any change other than that. I think all of it is just cost of living adjustment. And, uh, and it, it it's over uh, fifty percent of the general fund budget. Is that correct? That's correct. That's our single largest uh, department in the uh, general fund budget. So a lot of this is Lisa Josue. Help me, help me tune in. It looks to me like the real jump came in 2019 because it had jumped by January 1st, 20. So it seems like there was a really big jump there in 2019. Here. Um, Yes, and looking at this sheet, we've got we've got a, a eighty thousand dollar increase in in wages, uh, increase in in overtime, which we've taken down the overtime. We try to get a better control of overtime. A uh, big increase increase in part time wages, and we've scaled that back a little bit in our in our um, actual expenditure or actual part time wage expenditures are under control. We see big increases in health insurance, and then th those are the those are expenses. So the major expenses are up here in uh, in wages. Yeah, look at the increase in health insurance. That's significant. You know, I would be yeah. interested in in seeing these numbers with some of these um, expenses washed out, so we can really just see. Um, which, uh, um, you know, what the contribution of wages themselves a, a, a lot for that big jump, because it really looks like it happened in 2019. Well, the other was a big jump. Yeah, the other thing um, that maybe everyone remembers is it was last year that Colleen wanted to add on the uh, projected amount if people need to get paid out in terms of uh, you know, vacation or sick leave. So that- Ah, is, I remember uh, that. So all wage lines went up. I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was significant. And so I think in that sort of shakeout that you're talking about, Lisa, Matt needs to evaluate that approach. And I think we need to revisit whether that's the right approach in this budget. We, we did do some of that, Brian, and uh -huh. we have calculated that expense we did it here we looked at what is our accruals uh, hours liability and cash out so mm -hmm. we got employee by employee this is a, as of 1023 we looked at how much sick leave was accrued uh, what the payout would be what the accrued vacation is and what the vacation liability is and we've 
uh, total those up, and these are working off actuals. So we're looking at $106,000 uh, in liabilities uh, there on the accrual basis. So from a budgeting perspective, budgeting that cash out, what Colleen had proposed was a 6% um, increase to the wages as a cash out, cash out. Um, Buffer emergency. And it was really high and council didn't, didn't approve that. So what we did this time around is we wanted, we wanted to look at um, what, what the actual projection is instead of looking at a percent and looking at um, the amounts, where does our liability lay? And Matt, Matt wanted to do a more scenario based planning is looking at, all right, looking at the tenure, looking at our attrition rate to calculate best estimate, who's likely to leave and what's that going to cost us. So instead of doing an average amount, let's say, well, the average amount isn't going to yield as much uh, value because when you do the average, your average is going to be low and your average employee is likely not to leave. Um, so that's, uh, so we're taking a different methodology. If we, if we would have done that, uh, 6% 6 will be much higher versus what we're looking at now. This is for the entire organization. As of October 23rd, this was our accruals liability, 106,000. And we looked that up. How do you, how do you move that allocate around the different departments? And so in short, we have a better, better way of doing that than we did, um, than we previously did. Now, we also don't have what we had in 2019 and 2020. In 2019, we had an outgoing village manager with significant amount of sick leave accrued over a lifetime of public service. Uh, in 2020, we also had um, Susie, uh, Susie Yant with a lifetime of public service accrued. And we had uh, Ruth Ann um, and, and Colleen. Colleen, to my surprise, had um, uh, she brought in 1,100 hours from, um, from New Carlisle and only accumulated 116 hours here. But because of her policy, she was able to cash out all 1,200, uh, over 1,200 hours here at her, her full rate here, which was a significant increase from what she was earning in, uh, in New Carlisle. Um, I, I have a, a, another question. What is the full-time equivalent of the um, people working in the uh, YSPD and the full-time equivalent of everyone else in the village government? Okay, that question, I have to preface that with that the numbers, the head counts, we, could, uh, we can count a part-time person as a head count, but that doesn't mean that they're, they're a full salary. Um, so we could have in the allocation here, give you a good example is that we have part-time dispatchers that are counted at a, as, a, as a one employee for headcount purposes, but they don't necessarily are getting paid at a full-time salary. So a good example would be uh, Don Ward. She's a dispatcher and she's earning about 22,000 as a part-time dispatcher and she's counted as one uh, headcount. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's why I, I was asking full-time equivalent of yeah. YSPD and everybody else. So under this schedule, uh, the we police department, time. we have 12 full time. We have 12 full time and that is police and dispatch. And then part time we have eight, eight, seven. We have seven part time and uh, then we have 10 and one. So, so so 12, 12 full-time, and then when you add all the other part-time individuals, that brings us to 21 individuals uh, working in the, in the uh, police department. What that adds up in the total organization is 56, including council members and mayor. So that would be, once you take out the five council members and the mayors, that puts us at, uh, oh, and Judy, because Judy is listed in here as a dual role. Uh, that puts us at 49. Well, um, I guess this isn't really the time to go into this. And I have, I, I am in no way uh, dissing the police department. But when we're looking at over half of our budget, I think we really need to know 
how that money is being spent. And I still don't really understand what the full time, you know, do, are, are, does it represent over half of the full time equivalent working for the village government or not? I, I don't, I don't understand that. And, um, you know, give, given, I guess what I would like, and I'm not asking for it right now, is really an understanding of why we need exactly the number of officers and dispatch, and et cetera, and why that is necessary. I think it's a lot easier, you know, if we have someone running the water plant, yeah, you know, we know we need someone water the water plant or, you know, other positions, but the police, it's harder to tell, I think. Um, and it's such a significant part of the budget. It is, and what I can share with you right now is there's two aspects to the police department. There are two functions. You've got dispatchers and you've got the police officers and what's associated with the police officers. Um, dispatch, and we've had this conversation a little bit last year, and I know that it's been a topic of conversation in previous budget sessions. The dispatch costs us a little over a quarter of a million dollars. And then all the other stuff are, are public safety services. Mm -hmm. Um, from a budget perspective, I guess, Marianne, you looked at the number, you looked at the total expense, whether it's 1.4 to 1.7, um, and what that makes up in the total uh, expenditure budget. Yes, that's that's um, half a percent, uh, sorry, a little over half of the, of the general fund budget. What's included in here, um, there's also a $45,000 um, vehicle replacement. There's a vehicle that's um, outdated and need of, uh, need of replacement. Sure, so the vehicle that we're talking about is car 110, which is one of the Ford, it's actually the first Ford Explorer that we purchased back in 2016. Um, I don't have the exact mileage on that car, but just in, in the year 2019, we spent over $5,000 in repairs um, et cetera. In 2020 so far, we've spent over $2,500 um, in repairs. Um, so it's close to $8,000 that we've spent in repairs um, here soon. If we don't replace it, uh, we are also going to have to start replacing the seats on the inside um, of the vehicle, but um, the, the engine on it, and it, it's just old. Um, it's very old for a police cars and miles, et cetera. I have a book here of all the repairs that we did. That's where I got those numbers. And if I can add, Marianne, to your question a moment ago, I think the a general rule that I've tried to use since I've uh, taken this position were two officers on at all times. We we're close, we're still not there. Um, we have a, a, a shift between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. that is void, but that's where that lay. And then we still have one dispatcher on. Um, the difference, and you know, this is neither here nor, nor there now with our situation with the pandemic, but um, we are, you know, a village of 3,800 people. And on a good weekend, you know, that number can triple. Um, so that's one of the factors that's played into maintaining and trying to keep enough officers. So we have two patrol people on at the same time. No that helps. Yeah, I'm aware that because we are a so-called destination community, we have to we have expenses, the village government has expenses in that regard. I guess, am I the only council member that has this concern about the amount that we spend on the police department? No. <clears throat> yeah, we need, to, we need to look at it more carefully. So I think what these work sessions are about are flagging areas where we need uh, more detail. And I think you've uh, you know, presented some ways to do that. Um, we might need to also have uh, some kind of powwow uh, that might involve a subcommittee of sorts 
to dig into this a little bit. Um, so. I agree. I mean, for me, as I mentioned, you know, a little while ago, um, it would be helpful to get some of the, not that, not that these other line items aren't important, but some of the noise out of the, out of the totals, just to see what percentage is related to what. And also, I think it's important to understand, have a council hear more of the vision for how this headcount is going to be spent. Because there's lots of ways, you know, if the headcount's going to stay the same, that doesn't mean that the staffing ratios are going to stay the same. It doesn't mean that the vision might not be to bring in more social service personnel, things like that, that could um, guide our thinking about budget. So I think, I mean, yeah, budget's budget, it's numbers, but the budget supports the vision. So maybe it's mm -hmm. time to thread some of that in yeah. on this particular aspect of the general fund. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And I think it is just so important. I mean, given the time that we're in, you know, with all the anti-police stuff, and I think we all want to support our department. So, and I can certainly understand questioning the budget might feel like it's not supporting our department. But I think that every council member needs to be really satisfied, really understand, and really be able to speak to why we have the expense that we do, what our department does, and why we are standing behind it. And I don't, I don't have all of that understanding right now. So I'll, you know, some suggestions I'll make um, in thinking about what Lisa said and some of the work that can be done. For example, Josue, what you highlighted about the budget item to uh, transform uniforms. That's great to highlight that to me ties into yeah. that kind of visionary thing that Laura, yeah. that uh, Lisa referred to. Um, I think better thinking about uh, the bike patrol and foot patrol vis-a-vis -vis, um, our use of vehicles would be a good thing to factor in. So yeah. I would look at more of these kinds of things. And again, I think uh, it, it probably makes sense to pull in a council member or two once some of that work is done to do some additional brainstorming prior to you know, talking about this at council table. Good. We will work on these uh, on these items and suggestions. Uh, any other questions, suggestions? Yeah, this. I mean, I do know we uh, we discussed uh, access to gov deals um, in the past in general for for equipment. Do the used police vehicles or other police equipment, uh, do they get uh, put onto gov deals? Um, or any other, any other type of disposal where we can get some credit? Oh, you mean putting our vehicles on gov deals? Yes. Um, yes, we have before, but we kind of recycled ours too. Um, I know, like our last one, I think we gave to the last. The last couple, one went to a meter car, meter reader car that uh, was T boned at three forty three and sixty eight. The next one went to which is the one that Hostway is driving now. But we have uh, recycled things on gov deals, Kevin. Um, particularly some of the equipment that other agencies can purchase. Gov deals, uh, the majority of the stuff that we put up there have been um, property or things that the police department has taken in, found items that haven't uh, been no one's claim. We donate, um, which, which we're real proud of, 100% uh, of the bikes that we have remaining at the end of the year, those go to the STEM school in Springfield, which has a, a bike uh, program set up for students. And then I think, as you know, to your suggestion, was it two years ago, we gave Antioch those bikes. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything recently on the, uh, on that program. Well, yeah, we've got a bunch of bikes that we're afraid to have people share. 
So we're, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that, but yeah. Okay, great. I appreciate the, uh, the answer to the question. Thank you. All right, planning and zoning. I think that I believe the niece is on, on the, on the call as well. The planning and zoning is pretty, pretty straightforward budget. This includes uh, wages for the planning administrator and a portion of Raven's time. And then all the other expenses um, are related to pension, health insurance, life insurance, uh, workers' comp, and dental insurance. And that brings up the personnel expenses to the, uh, the 127. You'll see that that's an increase from the initial 2020 budget, and that's to make up for Raven's allocation and Raven's uh, expenses now that she is a full-time uh, employee. Denise, anything that you would like to add to that? I know, the, I know Denise, you've been busier than ever. You've hit a record number of permits uh, in 2020. Uh, and so certainly your workload has, has increased, which is the, why it's important to have a Raven assistance. Just in, uh, in solar from 2019 to 2020, we're looking at almost 40, sorry, 90 uh, solar customer applications. Uh, and that's in addition to all the condition, conditional hearings. Now you are working on a development that's the largest development in 50 years for Yellow Springs. And um, what else you wanna to add to this? Um, just, I think that it was a smart move um, <clears throat> for council to move my position to uh, an exempt position, um, a salary, because I, you know, I was killing you on overtime before um, you know, it isn't a 40 hour week job by any means. So um, that was smart. Okay. Um, contractual services just remains relatively similar to what it was. We did increase our advertising because um, Denise's job uh, requires legal advertisement and there's been a lot of uh, things come up that the expense are just, they are what they are and, by, and we're required to legally advertise things like conditional hearings and all the other work that, uh, that Denise is doing. Anything else you wanna highlight, Denise? Um, well, you know, we did uh, <clears throat> in that, uh, general operating expenses, um, we did increase. Um, I don't think we increased it any more than last year, the professional services. But just to point that out, that is um, <clears throat> people, the civil engineers and people that we have to use from time to time in the planning, in, uh, in the planning aspects. Um, what we did write into the subdivision contracts this year um, was to as uh, be able to at least get some of that that uh, recouping some of that expense back when we have to get independent um, reviews done for projects, but we we still do need them uh, from time to time for ordinance related issues. And we did add this legal services. I think if you are familiar with the decent job, um, there's two areas of work that take up a lot of legal services and that's uh, uh, council and, and planning. Uh, one, the village solicitor attends every planning commission meeting and that's at least uh, once a month in the BZA meetings. Uh, so we put in additional allowance for legal services for legal issues uh, that may come up. Okay, moving on to office supplies. That stays the same as it was in uh, 2020. Um, a lot of this expense uh, is um, driven by the expense of supplies related to the big, uh, big printer that um, Denise manages. She's able to print maps and other things. Those supplies are expensive, so that's a lot of the cost there. Anything you want to highlight, Denise? Um, yeah, operating supplies. Now, Johnny and I share that cost, but the but even shared, it's it's that expensive because of the ink for the for the plotter. 
um, but it's, uh, it is a great thing because we can also scan with it. Um, then books and publications don't, I've not had to use a lot of that. Um, but uh, we do have um, for license permits and things, we do have, that's a, up in the next one though. Um, we do have like recordings that we have to do with Green County as well, but not, not too much in those areas. So that brings our our overall budget to uh, from 140 to 150, and again, that's a lot of it is driven by the salary expense that we see an increase uh, that includes ratings allocation. So, so that covers that. Uh, anything on any questions for planning and zoning? Okay. Uh, we're, we have 701, but we just have one more program to get through, and that's a mediation uh, program. I, I think this is incredible value for the village. It cost us um, under $10,000, and it's, I think it's an incredible resource. Uh, I can't imagine anyone better running this program than John Gudgel. And you know, I see John Gudgel's invoice every month and I look at the number of hours and I look at how much uh, it cost us and it, it, it's just an incredible value. Any questions on mediation program? All right, excellent. Um, so the this brings us to a total expenditure of uh, 2.8 million. We'll make the adjustments that have been brought up in, in uh, and follow up on the task item. So once we get that done, we'll circulate the updated number. What we'll be discussing in the following weeks are the uh, special revenue funds, which are streets, parks, economic development, uh, and all these other activities. Green space, um, we've got the um, the police pension, which here the police pension is something we require to spend. And that number comes from the 20% uh, pension contribution that we need to make uh, for commissioned police officers um, and then these other ones. So these will be discussed at the special revenue uh, funds discussion and then enterprise is scheduled for uh, November 3rd. <coughs> so when we, uh, when we get to those conversations, this chart falls into, into greater focus. Um, we did try already try making allocate uh, cuts where we could. Um, a good example is, well, for streets, we had uh, in the initial 2020 budget, we were looking at, um, we had allocated $777,000 for the proposed 2021. We reduced that by almost 100,000. And so we're making changes as, uh, as uh, we work through these projects. So this will become a greater focus once we get to those uh, partner conversations. And uh, we will provide additional information on where we come up with the with the ending balances. Again, this is a better position than we expect it to be. And that's because we've had a strong 2019 uh, finish and we've been able to control budget uh, expenses so far in, in 2020. And we are uh, conservative and, and a lot of our numbers for 2021. So that's a much better position than we anticipated being in, uh, in at the end of 2019. Uh, being sensitive to time, it's 7.04. Any questions? Anything you would like to see us follow up on in addition to what has already been discussed? Well, Josue, just to clarify, you're doing special revenue and enterprise uh, on Thursday the 29th. Yes. Capital. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. So special revenue and enterprises next and then uh, capital on the third. Okay, thanks everyone. And uh, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Somebody want to say something? Okay, never mind. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. I move. Second. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank Thanks, you guys. for Great. all that work. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, let me stop.